This evening's lecture is part of a three-day conference workshop facilitation event called Circulating Knowledge East and West, where scholars from Europe, North America, Southeast Asia, like China, India, Singapore, are here to explore the history and meaning and nature of translation and circulation of knowledge, that is of natural knowledge or science, between cultures, cultures of pre-colonial and post-colonial up to the present period. Now you're welcome to attend, provided you fork out the 20 to 50 bucks for uh, attendance. Uh, and it'll hap it's happening over the next three days on the third floor of the Archibald Room, a series of talks on the meaning of translation and circulation of knowledge east and west. The conference itself is organized by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council sponsored seven year um, national project called Situating Science, um, a cluster for the humanities and social studies of science. I, alas, am the director of this project and it involves historians, philosophers, social uh, scientists, political scientists, studying nature in its cultural, social and philosophical setting. We do this kind of thing often. There has been a, a national lecture series, we just finished an na international conference on the meaning of objectivity in science on the West Coast. We'll be running a, lecture seri a national lecture series on science and its public space next year. So check our website on that sign and see what's coming up locally and internationally. This particular event, conference, and tonight's talk has a lot of co-sponsors. The International Opportunity Fund from uh, Shirk, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies or Research here at King's, the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute, Dalhousie University and the Killam Library and its archives, and of course the University of King's College and its wonderful president, Bill Barker. We also have an amazing support network of students and three excellent coordinators who have passed this project from hand to hand. Um, uh, Greta Reagan, uh, Andrew Fenton, who got the whole thing going, and Emily Tector, who has done an absolutely astonishing job at keeping this thing in order and putting up all those pink signs. One of the key inspirations for this evening lecture and co-organizer of this conference is this evening's lecturer, Dr. Sundar Surakai. I first met Sundar when I was touring on part of the cluster to talk with Indian scholars and do some of my own research on JBS Haldane throughout India. And I was told I must go to the Institute for Advanced Studies, the National Institute for Advanced Studies in Bangalore and meet Sundar, who is an upcoming amazing uh, philosopher and historian of philosophy uh, and the head of their philosophy program or humanities program at the, uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies and met about a year and a half ago and we plotted together to put together some kind of important event that would allow scholars as part of this cluster and in Canada to help bolster science studies in India and also in our interaction help scholars in Canada and Europe become less parochial. Luckily, or fortuitously, Dalhousie is the repository of a um, archive collection of the great James Dinwiddie, who was the first professor of natural philosophy at the uh, University of Fort William at Calcutta, and also the first um, uh, scientific attaché to one of the first British consulate uh, missions to China. And all of his works, or most of his works, are collected here, including his journals of his experiences in encountering cultures in China and uh, in and India. So why not put together a big conference and discussion about what it meant for knowledge to move across borders in the early modern, modern and maybe postmodern era. Dr. S uh, Sundar Sakarai is formerly the head of the Center for Philosophy at the National Institute for Advanced Studies in Bangalore. He is now 
the director of the uh, Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities at Manipal University, one of the biggest and most important private universities in India. Sir Kai uh, received his university training uh, starting out in physics and then uh, moved on with great gusto into philosophy and the philosophy of science. One of the leaders of the upcoming generation of Indian scholars, Sundar himself crosses borders, writing both on traditional Indian philosophy, the philosophy, classic philosophy of science, as well as phenomenology and logic. His books include Indian Philosophy and the Philosophy of Science from 2005, The Philosophy of Symmetry, Others include the tra uh, Translating the World, Science and Language, published in 2002. But today, he has come to talk to us about the nature of knowledge in Indian intellectual traditions. Let's welcome Sundar Sakari. Thank you very much, Gordon. It's a great pleasure to be here for many reasons, and um, not least because we are part of this dialogue and conversation on transmission and circulation of knowledge, but also because um, I think and I believe and I speak on behalf of many of my colleagues in India and Asia that um, situating science clusters is one of the great models in science studies in the world. And what we are hoping to do after this meeting is actually to extend part of what is happening here in Canada uh, to a larger network uh, in India and South Asia in particular. So I'm very uh, feel privileged to be part of this op uh, to be part of this event and to have this opportunity to share with you certain thoughts about a completely different tradition. Uh, particularly when you work on philosophy of science and history of science, uh, very rarely we engage with the question of what we call as uh, Indian knowledge systems or the way in which knowledge is conceptualized in different cultural milieu. So I, I thought of different topics and I thought, uh, given the topic of this conference, which is circulation and transmission, it is very important to clarify what the Indians and and you can extend this to the Chinese, you can extend this to the Japanese and so on. What did they mean when they talked about knowledge? What kind of a philosophical and a historical system they had? Um, because I think there are two or three fundamental reasons why we are interested in the question of transmission and circulation. You know, uh, most of you were probably not there in the conference in the morning, but there was one issue which repeatedly came up which was the question, I mean, in a sense, it could be read as the question of priority. Was calculus discovered in India first, or was it discovered in Europe? Did the Chinese contribute to the origin of modern science, or was it something indigenous, something which happened as part of a larger European Renaissance? At one level, I mean, there are various arguments to and fro for it, and at one level, you could ask, what does it matter? What does it matter if 500 years back calculus was started uh, in Europe through India or China, or it was started independently entirely as a different intellectual history? I want to suggest here two reasons why it is important to ask this question. Because I think that is the background on which I want to, uh, that's a background against which I want to discuss the nature of knowledge in Indian intellectual systems. It's important because of the way Asians, and I, I speak for not just of South Asia, and I speak for African civilization too, in the way in which the textbooks and the knowledge structures in these cultures have been defined, and what the students in these civilizations study, it's very important to have a proper historical understanding of where they are to be placed. I'll give you just two very quick examples just to motivate this discussion. One is the example of Hume, the great philosopher, uh, the English philosopher. And if you read any book in philosophy, I mean, you cannot but engage with Hume. And Hume is uh, uh, most well known for his skepticism on causality. And almost any textbook 
whether it's taught in India or whether it's taught in Canada or in the US, talks about Hume's empirical criticism of the idea of causality. Very important criticism. What was puzzling to me for long as a student of philosophy was almost every philosophical tradition in the world has developed very rich theories of causality. Indian philosophical systems of which there are many, causality is one of their fundamental preoccupations. They are fighting with each other constantly about the nature of causal relations, what is meant by cause, what is meant by effect. No standard textbook in philosophy even today when they talk about the basic question of causality and the question of skepticism about causality mentions any other writer of any diff other cultures including the very enormous contribution by Indian philosophers and Chinese philosophers on the question of causality. Now this becomes oddly little more surprising given that Hume himself in his own work on causality is influenced by Arabic philosophers. In fact as some writers have pointed out Hume actually uses an example which is in the Arabic works. There's another example and this is of uh, Ferdinand Saussure, the famous structuralist who has influenced a complete new breed of philosophers, uh, structuralists, post-structuralists, post-modernists and so on. And Saussure's again one of the most insightful contributions of Saussure was this idea that meaning is defined through difference, that one makes, one has meaning of a word not because of any positive connotation but because it's different from something else. Now when I first read Sasur as part of my class, what struck me again was the fact that the Buddhists uh, had articulated a theory in the 5th century by the very famous Buddhist logician Dignaga which is called the Apoha theory of meaning. And the Buddhists are fighting with another group of philosophers in India called the Naya, Nyaya philosophers. And the Buddhists set out a very elaborate theory of difference, meaning through difference. And that's what Apoha actually means. Now to me, it is, how, how does one make sense of the fact that here is Ferdinand Saussure in the you know, 20th century, writing, following very similar formulations of the Buddhists you know, in the 5th century. Of course, one could read this as, uh, you know, as a, f as, a, as a set of coincidences which happens across space and time. And that's a very valid argument as many of us, uh, similar arguments were uh, given in the morning. But the catch in this is the fact that Saussure was an Indologist. He was a Sanskritist. He was very well versed in all the Indian texts. Given that, how do we make sense of the fact that Saussure never mentions the Buddhist Apoha theory of meaning of which we think there is reasonable doubt that he could have known. Now raising questions like this is very problematical because what is at stake when we ask these questions? Now what I want to suggest to you is that what is at stake here is a proper recognition of intellectual histories of different cultures. Nothing more. It's not a question of priority. And that's the reason why the question of transmission and circulation is such an important problem uh, to cultures, uh, you know, non-European cultures. And um, the second fundamental reason why, especially in the context of science, we need to engage with this question of transmission and circulation of knowledge, which is where did the original ideas of science come from? Uh, uh, because many Asian cultures do not take ownership on the idea of science. If science is that which has been transplanted, which is, a, which is of a special origin of the European imagination, then what ownership do these cultures have on this activity called science? And this has had great detrimental effect on the larger society and the relationship between science and society. So at least for these two reasons, I think it's important to ask the question uh, about transmission and circulation a little more seriously. So I, w I want to begin my talk actually by invoking a contemporary example of transmission. Just to phrase this question uh, against what, what is happening today and why it is so important for many non-European cultures to actually engage with this question. And uh, this also arises from my puzzlement when I do philosophy of science, that philosophy of science is dominantly drawn 
from Western philosophy, right from Aristotle, Plato, to Kant, to Hume, and you name the legion of writers, analytical thinkers in the Western tradition, or if you if you're doing phenomenological tradition of natural science, you have another tradition of philosophers upon which you can draw in order to understand science. It's very interesting that mainstream philosophy of science has not drawn on other, other philosophical traditions like the Indian and Chinese to make sense of science. Now one might ask why should they have to use other traditions in order to make sense of science. The reason is very simple. Philosophy of science is fundamentally about philosophy and philosophical categories in order to make sense of science. And philosophical categories which are often used in philosophy of science are available in different cultures and are actually very differently dealt with. And therefore, uh, as part of the larger argument, what I want to uh, place before you is, the, is to place this question about the relevance of Indian philosophy or Chinese philosophy or non-Western philosophies for history of science. There has been long debate and historians of science know this well about the relevance of philosophy of science for history of science. I'm just extending that debate in order to, in, to make a point uh, here that other cultures of philosophical cultures around the world are also actually very uh, relevant to the understanding of history of science, particularly when we talk about science in different cultures and so on. So I'm going to motivate this argument uh, through an analysis of what constitutes the idea of knowledge in Indian intellectual traditions. And hopefully we will see at the end of it how different this whole construction of knowledge happens in these traditions. Um, I will begin with a contemporary example, something which is, happens around me all the time. In India now, as many of you might be aware, there is a, there's a very well established indigenous medical tradition and that, that's called Ayurveda. Now Ayurveda is a very long, has a long history and it's practiced by many people. I mean many of us actually go to Ayurvedic doctors. In fact, uh, in, if you go to Kerala, which is the southern state of uh, India, you find that the medical shops actually are called English medicines. English medicines sold here. English medicine standing for, standing for allopathy in general or what you call as modern medicine. I want to use this example of Ayurveda and allopathy to actually rephrase the question of transmission and circulation. I want to suggest to you that what is happening in the case of Ayurveda and allopathy is very similar to the questions we've been talking about uh, on how knowledge systems moved from India to Europe or not. Ayurveda now is a very grow, you know, it's a growing field. There are hundreds of students who do Ayurvedic. They get a degree, medical degree in Ayurveda. Now, Ayurvedic systems are very different systems, like other indigenous medical systems. The present day training in Ayurveda, all Ayurvedic doctors, although they come from a completely different uh, medical system, very different theoretical system, the way, they, the way they understand the body, the way they understand the meaning of health are very different from how the way modern science understands it. But yet, all Ayurvedic students, the, the students who are getting a degree in Ayurveda, are now taught a course in modern medicine, what we call loosely as modern medicine, which is allopathy. They are taught to use the stethoscope, so much so that um, uh, one of the Ayurvedic doctors I was talking to told me that whenever a patient goes to his uh, clinic, he uses a stethoscope and a BP machine to uh, does, you know, find out what his BP is. And he tells me then that, you know, Ayurveda never used that. And Ayurveda actually discovers your BP, or has a measure of your BP through what is called Nadi, which is pulse. So actually they will just keep their finger on your wrist and, and read the pulse. That's part of their medical system. Reading the pulse, a good Ayurvedic doctor can actually tell you, and although it may sound like mumbo jumbo to you, a good, I, I, because I've seen this extensively over many examples, a good Ayurvedic doctor will actually tell you if you have a sugar problem just by reading your nadi, which is your uh, pulse. Reading a pulse is a very special art of Ayurveda. But as this doctor said, he said, you know, today I don't, I, the people want me to, use, when I, the moment I use the stethoscope, I'm doing something very different. I'm doing some, using, incorporating modern technology in my indigenous medicine. Against the stethoscope, 
I want to offer you another example, and that's of a medicine called septillin. Now again, this is an example of an Ayurvedic drug. It's uh, marketed under the name septillin. It's one of the phenomenal success stories in India. It's a, it's, a medicine, it's a drug for immunity, especially if you have ear, nose, throat problems and so on. It's very efficacious and hundreds of people, I mean thousands of people buy it. The story of this, the example I'm uh, mentioning here is as follows. I went to a doctor, a very well-known ENT specialist in Bangalore, in a very big corporate hospital and you, you pay a lot to meet these doctors. And uh, after I mentioned to him I was having all kinds of cold and I was going out of the country, so I wanted some quick fix before I left because I didn't want to fall ill somewhere else. You know, he talks to me for 20 minutes and he tells me about all kinds of ENT problems and then he says in the end, without knowing that I know a little bit about Ayurveda, he says, you know, the best medicine I can prescribe for you or I can tell you to take, not prescribe, I can tell you to take, is this tablet called Septilin. Okay, septillin is over-the-counter Ayurvedic drug. It's not an allopathic drug. And between the modern medicine, allopathy and Ayurveda, they have a constant struggle. I mean, the history of Indian medicine today, in the practice of Indian medicine, is a struggle about the validity of Ayurveda as against modern medicine. Modern, uh, so-called modern medicine doctors do not allow Ayurvedic practice in, uh, in hospitals. And in the worst example, thanks to the Americanization of the Indian insurance, uh, the whole Indian medical insurance scheme, Ayurveda is not supported by medical insurance, but any kind of allopathic drugs are supported by medical insurance. And here is a case where an Ayur a very well-known allopathic doctor tells me surreptitiously, he's not, he doesn't want to write a prescription for me, go take septillin. He says, go take septillin, because he says, he knows that it is the most effective drug that he can prescribe to me. Now, if you ask him, and this is a question which historians will eventually have to answer, there will be no recorded document about the influence of Ayurvedic medicine in the practice of allopathy in India today. If 100 years from now, as historians, you look for records to see, was any kind of knowledge transmitted from Ayurveda to allopathy in the sense that it became valid knowledge for allopathy? Of course, there are many such examples like Septalin, which has happened in the Indian medical scenario. But are there recorded documents which will tell you how allopathy incorporated, appropriated Ayurvedic knowledge? I would be very surprised if you find one. Transmission is like this. And this is a question I'm, uh, you know, which we confront in India repeatedly across many different domains. And really the problem is actually about the nature of knowledge. The real problem in this is not that the uh, allopathic doctor wants to be nasty towards Ayurveda. I mean, that's a different story, the, the larger sociological, social politics of it. But it's, you know, deep down, this doctor really felt that Ayurveda is not about knowledge. The real problem between indigenous medicine and other kinds of knowledge systems which function in a place like India, as against modern knowledge systems, is there is a genuine problem in recognizing what constitutes knowledge. What, what is the epistemic value to particular ideas? Where, does, where is knowledge to be found in Ayurveda? Now, the, way, the reason why they might say this are many, but I'm just going to, um, uh, what I'm going to do is to point out how the idea of knowledge itself is fundamentally different in the Indian systems. <coughs> now, uh, there are many examples of this earlier. We have seen this before in the case of Indian steel, the example of Indian steel, which was the first example of very high quality steel done in ancient India. And when the British first came into uh, exposure with this Indian steel, um, as a very good work by um, uh, Claude Alvarez and Michael Adas show, their first response was to dismiss the capacity of this civilization to have had, you know, to have uh, created this very high quality steel. And the high quality steel is done in a craftsman like manner. It's done, it's, it's done with a baking mechanism called, uh, it's, it's called uku steel. It's, it's basically small clay crucibles in which you put iron ore and then you put twigs and leaves in it and bake the whole thing and get really high quality carbon steel. Now, when the, when the British first took this idea out and built the first steel mills, their response 
as to why the Indians did not know what they were doing. I mean, the, the British had a very interesting argument about it. They said, the Indians were making the steel. Yes, that's true. We grant you that because you have enormous examples of zinc making, steel making and so on. But the point is, the Indians didn't know what they were doing. They didn't have a method. So the, the, the colonial discourse on Indian science and technology, and this is something which is duplicated across other cultures like China and so on, is that, well, these people are doing something, but they don't actually know what they're doing. <laughs> That's because they don't have a theory. They just, they just practice. They're just practitioners in some sense. It's ironical that the discourse of modern science in India, the reason why scientists tell us that India is not doing very well in modern science, is that Indians are too theoretical and they are not practical enough. It's very ironic that in the matter of between colonial discourse and the state discourse on science, that there is complete shift on the capacity of Indians to be either theoretical or too practical. Now, why, I, I mean, I'm sure many of you know um, the very long uh, discourse on uh, the colonial discourse on Indian technology. So I'm just, uh, you know, when, when there are any questions, we'll talk about it a little more. Um, I also think that this question of asking what is the nature of knowledge in Indian intellectual systems has relevance to the claim of multicultural origins of science and that's a very specific question we've been talking about in our conference uh, about uh, you know what have the various factors what factors uh, contributed to the development of modern science in Europe. Now the way I want to therefore uh, set out my argument is first to suggest to you that the idea of there's nothing universal about the idea of knowledge that what the Greeks and then modern Europe in the, in the long European tradition, what they called as knowledge differed in very fundamental ways from what the Indians called as knowledge. And let me give you some examples of how this idea of knowledge is used in first in you know, uh, seminal developments in Indian mathematics, medicine, metallurgy, chemistry, astrology and a wide variety of various uh, activities. Um, the idea of knowledge is very central to all these activities, I mean mathematics, medicine, metallurgy, chemistry and so on. The way they were, the, the, the term which was used to understand the idea of knowledge in Indian traditions is actually called as pramana, this P-R-A-M-A-N-A, um, pramana theories are theories of knowledge. And different philosophical schools and the Indian philosophical traditions uh, has, you know, uh, orthodox schools, heterodox schools, and so on. There are different types of schools, and what characterizes Indian philosophical uh, systems are the constant debate they have with each other. And I'm talking about a time period which is uh, till the colonial period, till 16th, 18th century, you had a very flourishing uh, group of philosophical disputations which characterizes the very nature of Indian philosophy. Now, in for example, if you look at Indian mathematics and medicine, what is very interesting is that in all these disciplines, the idea of knowledge which you use in your practical production of uh, crafts and of medicine and including mathematics, the idea of knowledge is directly derived from philosophy. Um, you will see later on why I'm uh, emphasizing this because you will see in the development of modern science, this becomes a fundamental problem for uh, European science. In the Indian traditions, the idea, of uh, the idea of knowledge, which defines what you mean as knowledge in all these different traditions, comes from philosophy. So for example, uh, today morning there are some reference to the fact that there are no proofs in Indian mathematics, uh, but there are not only no proofs, I mean, uh, not only is the statement not correct, but there are very many examples, including various textual references on uh, uh, texts which give very detailed proofs. In fact, there's a very famous saying by Bhaskara, uh, one of the seminal, it's like the Euler of uh, European mathematics, uh, who argues that if you do not have the idea of demonstrating a result, the idea of demonstration as being equal to the Aristotelian demonstration, then you have not actually understood it. So he makes a distinction between somebody who can do just calculation and gets a result, whereas another who can actually demonstrate that result and convince another about it and says that, look, the difference is if you do not have, a, if you have not understood it, if you are not able to demonstrate it, therefore adduce proof, you have not really understood 
what the what you are doing and you find the example of proofs in mathematics as um, uh, you know uh, across disciplines in all kinds of different results and so on in yukti pramana and medicine for medicine like ayurveda uses yukti pramana is evidential knowledge so the, here the question is how does a particular evidence of symptoms and so on what constitutes evidence which then can be used to say something knowledgeable in that particular discipline so this is a another very good example of how um, um, uh, you know uh, how knowledge systems are used and finally what unifies all these approaches to knowledge is the use of a particular school of indian philosophy which is called nyaya i'm going to speak a little bit about it nyaya translates as um, nyaya translates as uh, actually nyaya is a very interesting word it translates as logic it translates as reason it translates as justice in fact if you ask for the word for justice in all indian languages the word is actually nyaya uh, that's because indian views of indian views of justice were based on the argument that justice itself had to have reason justice is a judgment of reason and the and what we call as logic in the particular i'll explain to you what i mean by that and uh, so nyaya is a very dominant rationalist tradition in indian philosophy it's a realist school it is a school which comes closest to the way you can understand science in fact in what follows i'm going to argue and show you hopefully and hopefully convince you that nyaya comes closest to a philosophy of science which is articulated in india because not only were they realist they understood the world in terms of things which, which are there in the world they were also the the particular school which contributed to um, the the whole idea of uh, logic and the idea of larger sense of rationality and nyaya is the philosophical tradition which is consistently used whether it's in indian mathematics or in medicine and all definitions of knowledge and understanding of knowledge comes from the way this particular philosophy understood the nature of knowledge so how did they understand what knowledge actually meant the first point when i am using the word knowledge and just to show you why the idea of knowledge itself is so problematical when you compare the greek and the indians is the fact that unlike the western tradition the indian tradition of knowledge was described entirely in terms of a dispositional characteristics or in modern uh, terminology indian philosophical description of knowledge is always cognitive you always describe states of achieving knowledge you have a cognitive state and that cognitive state is a state of having known something and this is something which is uh, common to all the indian philosophical traditions that the human subject the cognitive capacity of the human subject is explicitly invoked in all claims about knowledge and any claims about the world that is in other words unlike the later so called modern western tradition the indian tradition is explicitly cognitive which has been misunderstood sometimes as being explicitly psychological remember that a very important shift in western theories of knowledge happens when you are able to move from my experience of knowing something to saying it is indeed the case that there is this particular case and the the idea of knowledge gets removed from the experience of the human subject but indian philosophers whether it's the buddhists or the nayayikas or the nyaya people do not seem to make this move so first i'm going to show you what are the basic differences in order to recognize that there is a completely different formulation of what we mean by knowledge in the greek tradition post and the greek and the post greek tradition there was a very important shift um there is a very important shift which characterizes their view of knowledge which is the fact that logic was divorced from epistemology logic was separated from epistemology epistemology is a theory of knowledge and logic as a set of formal structures which order the way we think and this distinction between logic and epistemology is very influential for the development of modern epistemology and in a very loose sense on what happens to uh, philosophy of science the way science understood knowledge the indian traditions 
again across different traditions. Remember, I'm repeating that because to say that there are these, uh, you know, eight, nine, or sometimes we break it up, fine grain it, there are many more schools which are constantly fighting with each other and want to prove the other wrong. I mean, that's all that Indian philosophers did. But they had one common link, which is that they do not make the logic epistemology distinction. They do not separate logic from epistemology. And this has very serious consequences. I'll try and explain to you why. In fact, one of the immediate consequences is that there is nowhere in Indian theories of knowledge or in Indian philosophical systems, there is nowhere a distinction between pure and applied. In fact, you actually can't find in a variety of cases, if you look for uh, the ideas of pure science versus applied science, there is actually no such distinction called the pure and applied. There are no distinctions such as the formal and the empirical. A central core of Greek thought, which then, as I said, influences modern epistemology, there is no distinction between the formal and the empirical. There is no distinction between theory and practice. Theory as completely divorced from practice. There is a particular idea of theory and there is a particular idea of practice and the way in which they are integrated, come, the, the way in which they are occur together all the time defines what is meant by knowledge in all Indian traditions. There is no ethics metaphysics distinction. Which means that what happens with the origin of modern science in the West in where the ethical position of the knower is removed from the claims of knowledge, that is the distinction between the knower and what is known is clearly made, which is what makes modern science possible. And there's a wonderful long history of how that happens. There are questions about it, we'll talk about it later. Does not happen in Indian and Chinese traditions. Ethics and metaphysics as two distinct disciplines in uh, Greek thought doesn't happen. And the Indians just don't see the world that way. So if you could re rewrite the famous book on women are from Venus and men are from Mars, you would write, Indians are from wherever. Um, I think they would like to be from Venus. And uh, you know the Europeans are from Mars and the Chinese are from Mercury or whatever, whatever. The fact is that they have different ways of seeing the world. And the, the fundamental categories which influence modern knowledge systems, modern scientific knowledge, are not taken as presuppositions in many of these disciplines. Now, there is yet another, I think, a very, very influential uh, view, which has influenced again uh, how modern science is perceived in the Indian traditions, which is you do not find Platonism. The idea of numbers as Platonic ideals, which has so much influenced philosophy of mathematics to the present day, is just not available for the Indians. They do not buy into the story of Platonism, which is that there is an entirely different realm in which mathematical entities like numbers inhabit. Because, you know, in this long tradition, mathematical entities like numbers are not part of our ordinary world. Because if they are part of our ordinary world, they have to have some space and time. So they actually exist in a Platonic world in which they are not spatial, they are not temporal. Platonism is completely, uh, cannot be found in the Indian tradition because consistently mathematics is always seen as empirical. The distinction between the pure and applied, between theory and practice does not even happen in the case of mathematics as empirical. And a very good example which often people do is to talk about the square root of 2 which as we know was very problematical for some Pythagoreans and Neo-Pythagoreans. Uh, because you know the whole idea of square root of 2 uh, being an irrational number comes from that. The Indians dealt with square root of 2 in a very funny way. They just calculated it. They didn't bother about the metaphysics of it. You know, can there be some object like that? Can there be irrational number? And in fact, the way it occurs is they use mathematics uh, for calculating what the Vedic pious, where they do sacrifices and they have these, uh, they build these uh, squares. And the question they ask uh, in one of the texts is if I want the area to be doubled, what should my length change by? That's all. If the length, if the area should double of a square, the length should change by square root of 2. So promptly those guys calculate what it is and say, these are builders. They are ordinary, ordinary carpenters and house builders who are doing mathematics. To them, mathematics is part of the world experience. The shift, again, as mathematics is a transcendental domain, 
does not occur in any of the Indian philosophical systems. Which means the way they understood nature of knowledge associated with mathematics was very different. And remember the, the last part, of this point is so important because if there is one idea which influences the idea of knowledge in Western civilization, it is the idea, it is the model of mathematics as giving you certain knowledge. The idea of certainty which repeatedly uh, till, uh, you know, um, uh, till it's uh, Boyle and Newton overthrow it in some sense or question it in some sense is goes back to this belief that mathematical knowledge is as certain is an absolutely certain knowledge and that is a model for all knowledge and when empirical sciences cannot match with that particular no kind of knowledge as in mathematics it leads to all kinds of problems which is what modern science even today in philosophy of science we still grapple with that particular question because there is a tradition of certainty associated with mathematical knowledge which infects the whole idea of knowledge in the Western tradition. In the Indian tradition, there is no such idea of certainty because mathematical knowledge is as empirical as knowledge about the world. And uh, again, the question here is not whether this is a better way of seeing the world or a worse way of seeing the world. To me, what's interesting is that it's a different way of seeing the world. And if it's different way, in some context it may be useful. In some context, uh, it definitely may not be useful. So I'm going to show you one example, um, actually two to three quick examples of how the Indians uh, defined uh, this question of the logic epistemology link. And just to illustrate to you how differently they understood a simple process which is such as inference. Okay? We know again from the Greek tradition, inference is the first major contribution uh, of Aristotle. I mean, we talk about Aristotle and syllogisms and so on. And the idea here is very simple, that we make inferences, and we make inferences in very particular ways. Now, what the Greeks do, and what Aristotle does with these inferential uh, structures, various kinds of inferential structures, is to uh, formalize it in the sense, uh, I mean, this is something which most of you know, so I won't talk about it, is to formalize it in the sense that the inferences we make are nothing but products of the way in which sentences get connected, or rather the form of syllogisms define the in inferences we make. That's it. So it's largely a question of about some kind of a structural mechanism from which we make new inferences. So the most famous example which all of us do, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, and immediately we say therefore Socrates is mortal. Because all that we have done there uh, for the Greeks is to connect certain kinds of terms in the structure and give an inference which is obvious from the structure. Now for this kind of a, a Greek syllogism, it does not matter if it is true or not. And that's why they make the distinction between valid reasoning and sound reasoning. So you could say uh, all men are pigs and Socrates is a man and therefore Socrates is a pig works very well within the structure. Um, I'm just trying to be politically correct. That was the example. Um, so the point is that um, this kind of a structure of inference, it seems very simple. I mean, after all, isn't it so universal to say, you know, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal? I mean, isn't that universal? Shouldn't all, uh, all civilizations which have an idea of inference, and remember, inference is so fundamental to human thought, and every culture has discussed inference in great detail. The Chinese do it, the Indians do it, and the Africans do it in very different ways, but they do it. Which is to say, there are two kinds of inferences which the Indians talk about a lot. And I just give an example, just to, which is the inference that if you see smoke, you infer there is fire. And the example of smoke fire, which is a standard example in all Indian textbooks, is actually an example which is used across Greek tradition, the Stoic tradition, and the, you know, the whole uh, ancient, uh, ancient medieval historians and uh, you know, uh, historical logicians. It's a very common example. I see smoke, I infer there is fire. Now, the Greeks, you could write the structure, uh, modus ponens, as saying, if smoke, then fire. Smoke, therefore fire. That's it. And that's so simple. I mean, that's so universal. We would, one would think that independent of culture, you would say, if smoke, then fire. Smoke, therefore fire. Or all men are mortal, Socrates men, Socrates mortal. It's universal, except for Indians, except for the Chinese, except for many, many other cultures.
except for the Greeks. Um, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. very, very late, but you're talking about Yeah, no. so let me come to that. I'll give this example so you'll see what, what is it. I'm more concerned about showing you what is, how the Indians actually do this particular idea of inference. What is the model of inference they actually give? And this is a, this is a standard, what is called the Nyaya syllogism, which is a five-step process, what people uh, translate as Nyaya, Nyaya syllogism, which is a five-step process, which is, um, um, so they present it like this. The idea is very simple. You see smoke, and therefore you infer there is fire on the hill. So they write that five-step syllogism as saying, proposition, there is fire on the hill, uh, reason for there is smoke. And then they add a term example, wherever there is smoke, there is fire, as in the kitchen. And application of that particular case, this is such a case, there is smoke on the hill. And conclusion, therefore it is so, there is fire on the hill. Now, uh, you know, it, when Western scholars first came across the Nyaya syllogism, um, they were, you know, very dismissive for a very long time. In fact, if you look at the history of Indian logic and the very the, the idea of Indian logic itself seems like a misnomer, um, what you find till till last century, I mean, till a few decades ago, was uh, a, you know was great confusion about what these logicians were doing. And the confusion was not really about there's fire on the hill for the smoke, etc., etc. The real confusion was in this term of the example, that as in the kitchen, you know. So the real problem, when, when logicians tried to interpret what the Indians were doing, the argument was that, look, this is what the Indians were doing was not logic. Because they forget one very important rule of logic, which is that you do not expect in a logical structure to present a particular example like in the kitchen. That bringing in a particular example, localizing a particular inference by saying that as in the kitchen, to then does something which is uh, very, goes against the grain of logic in two sense. One, it brings in a particular, so there is a particular kind of inference. So people have called it case-based inference, etc., etc. Or you can understand it by saying, look, by bringing in this idea of the kitchen here, they have not understood the implications of universal structures of logic. The logic is to give you, if you like, as uh, Boulos calls it, universal laws of thought, particular ways of relating thought, if you like. But bringing in specific empirical examples actually, again, can, uh, shows the confusion in an Indian logician about logic and epistemology. Now, there is another argument here also, which was that the Indians did not separate deduction and induction. So deduction, like the Socrates example, induction, as, as many of you know, generalizations, examples of generalization. And that, therefore, the Indians did not understand the distinctions between deduction and induction. And these were, you know, I think, very important uh, criticism for uh, uh, Indian logic. Now, uh, I won't enter into this long debate on whether Indians use deduction or induction. As many of you can see, the kind of uh, logical inferential structures which are present. What I want to uh, jump to across time and space is to show you another model which has a reasoning which does something very similar to this. Now, uh, this is called the deductive nomological model of scientific explanation. And I'm making this jump uh, knowing well that we are talking across uh, space and time. But if you'll just bear with me for a few minutes, hopefully I'll be able to show you why I'm making this jump here. Now, uh, in philosophy of science, there's a very important question about what characterizes science. I mean, that's a question which, you know, uh, every era we keep re-asking that question. What are the markers that characterize science? And one of the markers that characterize science is the nature of explanation which science does. And the nature of, there's something special to the way science explains facts in the world, phenomena, and so on. And uh, Hempel and Oppenheimer, came up with a model which is called the deductive nomological model of explanation. And in their view, the, this is the way they thought, what, this is the, this is, that structure was what they thought characterized the speciality of scientific explanation. Now if you look at the DN model, what is called the deductive nomological model, basically the idea is that whatever you want to explain 
is finally a, a, a valid directive argument. The sentences which you use in the argument must contain at least one general law. I will give you an example so you see what I am saying here. And this is a very important point which they bring in, which is that the explanations must be empirically testable. That is, what they are trying to say is that what you explain is actually a deductive consequence of various premises. One of the premises is a general law and one of them is an empirical statement. Okay, and finally, the explanations in the sentences must be true. I mean, this is a uh, this is what is called the directive nomological model. I'll give you an example, so you will see. Uh, if I want to explain why uh, a particular Bunsen flame turned yellow at a particular time, so what what uh, the DN model is trying to tell you is what is the way of explaining the fact that the Bunsen flame turned yellow at a particular time. And if it is a scientific explanation, according to them, that explanation must validly come out as a, in the form of an argument with one universal uh, uh, law and one empirical compound, which is a piece of rock salt was placed in this Bunsen flame at a particular time. Now, um, why I'm giving you this example is that you can actually rewrite the Nyaya model of explanation in terms of the DN model. That wherever there is smoke, there is fire. There is smoke on this hill, uh, like in the kitchen as an empirical example. Therefore, there is fire on the hill. Now, this is, uh, you know, I, this is just to illustrate to you already that the dismissal of Indian logical systems by uh, very many eminent logicians uh, is actually based on a particular misreading of what those logical syllogisms actually meant. That there is actually a very different way of understanding what the early Nyaya syllogisms were doing. Now that uh, goes back to the larger argument that the early Indian philosophers were actually doing something um, which was what we call today as prototype of theory. They were trying to make sense of the empirical world and trying to develop a theoretical model to understand the world in a very particular sense. And the Nyaya example, uh, which as I said, is a model of the rational structure of uh, Indian thought, gives you one clue on how to understand the differences in the way they formulated uh, descriptions of inference and so on. Now the Buddhists um, in the fifth century modify this model. And, they, and what the Buddhists do is something remarkable. Because you will find what the Buddhists, how the Buddhists analyze inference actually leads to a very different interpretation of uh, logic inference and its relationship to knowledge. And this begins to characterize all Indian theories of knowledge. And this is uh, this Buddhist view, the Buddhist model of the inference uh, becomes a model upon which other philosophical traditions change and develop. And they're always in a constant debate. I mean, as I said, uh, Indian philosophical traditions are characterized by the fact that they are in constant debate with each other and they want to uh, pull down the other. The Buddhist model of inference is actually very simple. And uh, the idea is that inference is about inferring about a, a particular relationship between a sign and what it stands for. So when I see smoke, the smoke functions as a sign from which I infer that it stands for fire on the hill. That's it. So what the Indian uh, Buddhist logicians do, starting with Dignaga, is to convert the question of logic into a question of semiotics. They, they ask the question repeatedly. So the complete tradition, post-Buddhist tradition, is, and, and this is, uh, remember, that what, when I'm, I'm talking about logic, because this logic, this idea of logic uh, is the fundamental core of what they understand as knowledge in the Indian philosophical system. So if there are uh, typically all Indian philosophical schools have what are called uh, means of valid knowledge. One is perception, and the second is inference. And then they also have testimony and so on, which is standard at this point, as you know. But inference is common to all. Perception and inference are the two valid means of knowing. And knowledge is a way of understanding what happens in perception, what happens in inference. And the, the Buddhists convert the question of knowing through inference as just nothing more than analyzing the relationship between a sign and a signifier. When I see smoke, I infer that there is fire. Why do not I infer from seeing smoke? Why am I not saying there are goats on the hill? 
Why am I not saying just because I see smoke, there are elephants running down the hill? What is the relationship between a sign and what it stands for? And you will see uh, very interestingly, the way they describe this particular relationship is actually, it's very simple. What they do is they say, well, I know a sign signified relation is present if it satisfies three conditions. One, it must have happened at least once, and therefore it goes uh, fundamentally against uninstantiated cases. You know, there has to be a, at least one case where it has happened, and it should be present in a similar case, and it should not be present in any dissimilar case. Now, what I'll give you a very quick example to uh, give you an idea about how they analyze this. If I see smoke, I infer there is fire. And how do I know that smoke is a valid sign for fire? I know it because I do a test for it, a kind of computational algorithmic test, if you like. One is to see if there are similar cases in which it has happened. And here they will give light in a kitchen. The example of a similar case is to give examples which the opponent can understand. You can't give exotic examples. It's part of uh, you know, a way of what they call as convincing the other, inferring for the others. So you would say there is a similar example, like uh, you know, uh, in a kitchen, where I know in a kitchen smoke and fire go together. But that's not enough. And there's a long tradition among Buddhist logicians whether that condition is enough, why should I need more conditions, and so on. And then there is a third, the third condition is, it should not be present in any dissimilar case. And here the argument is that if you find smoke over a lake, and since water cannot, if smoke is seen over a body of water, and since water is contrary to fire, and I know that fire cannot exist in water, therefore, if such a case happens, then I know that smoke is not invariably concomitant with fire. That's it. So what they do is to give this analysis of the inference, first of all in terms of a semiotic reading, and secondly in terms of what they call as similar and dissimilar cases. And remember that the ideas of dissimilar cases are very important to the larger debate on falsification uh, and uh, you know one negative example uh, destroying a complete induction and so on. I mean, you can have thousand, one million examples to support an inductive inference, but all you need is one negative instance to completely falsify it. So um, there have been many discussions on what the Buddhists were doing when they were doing this. I'll just give you two uh, quick insights into what is actually happening, primarily in order to connect it to the idea of scientific knowledge. Again, I'm making a very problematical claim, and I'm sure many of you will have problems with this claim, which is that the way in which Indians formulated their theory of knowledge through a study of inference is very similar to how the early ideas of epistemology in scientific epistemology happens. And I'll give you again, just to motivate that, I'll give you one example of um, uh, very influential methods uh, which if you do philosophy of science, among the first things you will learn um, are Mill's methods. Uh, there are five different methods to find out uh, <coughs> how do you identify a particular cause. So if there are four factors A, B, C, D causing one particular event, how do I know which of those four causes actually is responsible for it? And Mill has different methods called method of agreement, method of difference, and a joint method of agreement and different. It's often uh, called by commentators the most important of the methods. Now, um, I will, uh, since I do not have time, I'm not going to, we'll discuss this if there are any questions, but you can take partly my word for it or partly read the published literature on this. But um, the argument here is the Buddhist theory of inference and knowledge, um, actually the three conditions that you see uh, have very strong correlations with methods of agreement and difference. And uh, we can discuss about it, but as I said, um, you know, you can get a brief idea about it. And Matilal, uh, the very well-known Indian philosopher at Oxford, who actually initiated some of the seminal studies of Indian logic, first makes a reference to this in the early 90s, and there has been some work uh, trying to show, trying to find out what is the connection between the Buddhist way of understanding inference and what Mill was doing uh, as a very important part of method. Now, uh, primarily what happens with the Buddhists is that logic is seen as semiotic that there is some fundamental relationship between the larger understanding of what it is to know 
and the relationship between sign and signifier. And one finds that one can actually do this extensively in Buddhist systems. Now, interestingly, there is a, a long European history about this, uh, uh, you know, semiotics in uh, medieval times. Um, there is very interesting correlations with it. If there are questions, I'll talk to you about it. The only point I'll make is that um, whether it's Occam's idea of mentalization of science or it's uh, Roger Bacon's ideas of different types of inferences, you find in both of them that till the 16th century or so, and some commentators mark it till Leibniz's uh, uh, idea of uh, you know, uh, the writing being related to science, that until then, the, there is a strong tradition in Western thought in which logic is seen as a cognitive enterprise, just like the uh, early Buddhist logicians have done. And then it is not that it was something very special to what the Indian logicians were doing. There is a strong uh, line of thinkers where in which they argue for the semiotic understanding of logic as well as the cognitive understanding of uh, logic or, uh, or inferences like some of the Indian philosophers have been doing. Uh, there is also another reason why this is very important, uh, especially in the context of science, uh, of science is that inferring the signified from a sign is very central to what is special about science. Now, you know, those of us in, in philosophy of science would have come across this in very many different ways. One very simple illustration of, the, of this is the fact that when science has to infer from experimental observations, it does not see an electron or an atom, for example. What it sees are particular markers of these entities. Now, what theory allows you to do in a very important sense is give you the capacity to move from a sign to what it stands for. A very valid judgment on a photograph, a scratch on a Wilson cloud chamber as actually standing for an electron which is bent. Now, that link is what uh, is, is a very important role in which theory plays. So, um, while this does not mean that the Buddhist logicians were doing scientific theory, very far from it because they were not even engaged with the activity of science. But methodologically, what they were doing was establishing structures which are, uh, which are very similar to the concerns of uh, scientific perception. How do you uh, move from a sign to a signified? And uh, Nyaya also has another very important thesis which is uh, similar to another important thesis in science which has been called the affability thesis that uh, whatever is knowable is nameable, that there is nothing outside language uh, uh, for uh, science. And finally, um, Navya Nyaya, that is a new Nyaya, that is a later Nyaya if you like, the later Nyaya, you know, 12th century onwards, the 10th, 11th, 12th century, they actually develop a technical language. It's uh, the first precursor to what happens in the long tradition of technical languages in which loosely if you like you can put mathematics and uh, the, the technical language of Navya Nyaya is basically an attempt to make Sanskrit more precise. I mean already Sanskrit as you know is a very structured language uh, with very less ambiguity uh, once you use it but what the Navya Nyaya does is that they create a special language for philosophy so that what little ambiguity is there in Sanskrit uh, they attempt to remove it. It becomes very cumbersome and complicated but that becomes actually the major uh, model for other philosophical traditions to use. So that particular uh, Navyanyaya language, uh, technical Sanskrit if you like, um, becomes a model for various other philosophical traditions in India after this 12th, 13th century. Now, um, so I have about another three minutes. So what I'm gonna do is to um, very quickly, I mean these are points which uh, uh, are just conclusions, so I will not describe them much, but I just uh, want to bring this to your attention. But given, in spite of all this work on Indian philosophy, logic, uh, science, technology and so on, uh, consistently uh, the way in which these traditions have been read have led to a rejection of Indian logic, epistemology, science, rationality and even philosophy. I mean there's a long tradition of very well-known Western philosophers who, have, uh, who explicitly note that Indians don't have science, they don't have logic, they don't have philosophy and so on. Now when they are saying that, I don't want to read that as some kind of a bias because that's not what is happening here. They, are, they, they say it because their understanding of these terms are different. You know, when, uh, when the whole uh, 
the what we call as the triumvirate of uh, Western uh, German idealism, Hegel, Heidegger, and Husserl, who all of them note that Indians don't have a philosophy. What Indians have, what we call as Indian philosophy, is not philosophy at all for them. And they explicitly write in great detail about why Indians don't have philosophy, which is taken up by uh, somebody as contemporary as Gadamer uh, in his work when he begins by saying, uh, Indian and Asian cultures don't have an idea of theory or philosophy in that sense. So there, I, I don't want to read it as saying, look, it is a question of, uh, you know, they're all biased. I, I, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. What makes more sense to me is the fact that their category, the way they understand logic, the work they expect from something called logic, reason, philosophy, are very different. These are very different terms we are using across different cultures. And why I'm saying that is because that's really at the heart, fundamentally, of what is happening in the contemporary times. And that's why I want to use this example to tell you um, why, uh, what the, the real problem therefore is, what they call as knowledge and what the Indians call as knowledge are very different kind of terms. So that itself is a site of contention. And therefore, when I, when I look at a conference like transmission, transmission and uh, circulation of knowledge, I, I, across cultures, it's not a question of what, who took what ideas from whom and so on. I mean, there are very fundamental different metaphysical positions and knowledge itself functions as a contentious term. And therefore, even when ideas are taken up, they are not, there is no value addition to them because you don't think you're taking knowledge. You say, oh, that's, that's something I heard off my head or so on. Because the contemporary example I want to give for you is that it's okay to take our septillin, but not the stethoscope. That's the point. It's okay. I mean, the, 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 the doctor can give you septillin and it is part of now the larger vocabulary of allopathic medicines without any larger understanding of Ayurvedic medicines. But stethoscope, it's impossible. In fact, the medical doctors in India have written to the government protesting the fact that Ayurvedic doctors are taught the basics of modern medicine, which is basically putting the stethoscope and using it. Ayurvedic doctors don't want to use it. They think patients think they're doing something modern. They say we don't need the stethoscope. And the stake there is for modern uh, medicine doctors, they say don't take the stethoscope. You, you know, we can take the septum but not the stethoscope. So the point, not again, one is about bias, but I'm saying let's look beyond this larger questions of bias and so on. The point here is that septillin, the idea of knowledge associated with septillin is different from the idea of knowledge associated with the stethoscope. That's really the point of contention. In other words, if we can validate the epistemic value of septillin and other cultural understandings of knowledge, then the debate goes on to a different d domain. And therefore, uh, it suggests to us, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm putting this with a lot of hesitation because people react in different ways. Some people react with violent the idea of incommensurability. I'm just saying very loosely that is the idea of knowledge itself incommensurable across cultures, which only means that every time, it doesn't mean that we can't talk about it, but it just means that every time we talk about it, we expect some qualification or we expect some kind of understanding that these are, they could be talking about two different things when we talk about knowledge itself. And um, uh, very quickly, I'm just going to point out to you, therefore, that the conflict between early science and the philosophical ideas of certainty of knowledge, uh, in a very, you know, again, very good uh, authority, a very well um, meaning writers have written extensively about it. Uh, but when it comes to the way in which um, Newton shifts the understanding of the certainty of knowledge to uh, the mix of the empirical and the theoretical, there is definitely uh, there is a need to to change the idea of knowledge from the classical Greek tradition to accommodate the idea of scientific knowledge, and uh, that you know is uh, you know a very important part of what is meant by scientific knowledge. To therefore, in the development of modern science, uh, very importantly, and Locke, uh, Locke's intervention in this is very important. Um, is that you have to modify the idea of certainty associated with uh, the idea of knowledge in order to accommodate scientific knowledge. And therefore, there is something in the idea of scientific method which actually functions close to Indian epistemology. For the simple reason, Indian epistemology is empirical. It does not make the kind of uh, uh, structures which actually bothers this. So finally, uh, I'm going to keep this open as a set of questions about implications for questions of transmission and circulation of knowledge. And to me, while uh, I find I, I uh, 
as a historian, I mean, not being a historian, but even if I were a historian, I would find it very difficult to be able to uh, think we could resolve questions of whether Kerala School of uh, Astronomy, I mean, Kerala School of Mathematics. The uh, first idea of calculus comes from them or not, whether Tycho Brahe's model, which exactly mimics the Kerala astronomer's model of, uh, you know, the geo-heliocentric model. Did Tycho Brahe get it from these uh, guys, which was nearly 100 years back from the Kerala astronomers? I mean, I don't know how to answer these questions and historians tell me there is nothing called documentary evidence, so perhaps it's not answerable. But to me, the question about transmission and circulation is actually captured very well in contemporary questions like the allopathy Ayurvedic which I see. And uh, I see this uh, dynamics happening across uh, different domains. And uh, if I look at the contemporary movement of knowledge from natural to social sciences uh, and vice versa, um, I'm sure many of you know that in philosophy of social sciences, very similar questions about what kind of knowledge one appropriates or doesn't appropriate, what is taken over from uh, uh, natural sciences to social sciences. Uh, knowledge from indigenous uh, systems to mainstream systems and vice versa in contemporary uh, the thing. So I'm uh, removing this historical temporal dimension and uh, this which I'm not going to talk about, the use of mathematics in the natural sciences. I mean, all of this, again, very contentious questions of what is it to apply mathematics and so on, uh, illustrate to me certain aspects of the dynamics of the transmission and circulation. Um, and I, they say, you know, to me, I think while it may not answer the larger questions of the origins of modern science or the multicultural origins of modern science, it uh, makes us understand to some extent what really transpires when we say somebody got this idea from there or some piece of knowledge went from one uh, uh, culture to another. Thank you. Yeah.